Okay, so I want to do a sort of soft video to give some kind of vague cartoonish pictures of how some of the very basic ideas in category theory interrelate. So I'm not going to go into any technical details. I'm just going to lay out a few kind of vague pictures and draw a mind map and try to convey some of the relationships between some of these basic ideas uh, in category theory, which we've encountered so far in this series, Category Theory for Beginners. I wanted to sort of make a kind of vague picture of it, which I've shown here, and also picture some of the concepts which are coming up and try and give a kind of feel for where we're going in this series of videos and what kinds of things to expect and maybe some kind of study tips about doing category theory. So before I explain about this picture, I just want to go through a sort of analogy about what learning category theory is about, in my opinion. Category theory is something like, I mean, this is just a analogy okay but it, it's something like a sort of palace okay um so it has various entrances and then there's a kind of interesting structure inside lots of rooms treasure etc now the first thing that you need is a kind of key to get in the door that's like the basic definitions okay so you need to know what a category is you need to know what a functor is. You probably need to know what a natural transformation is, etc. And the next thing is that you need to sort of find an entrance and then get in and explore all the structure. And then, I mean, the real treasure of it is actually seeing how everything is interconnected together. So let's just recap a few of the things that we've done already and how they're related to each other. So we started out, one of the first things that we defined was the idea of a terminal object. And then we thought about this notion of a product. Now, as we define these notions in category theory, we, we see them applied in different categories. And that's obviously one important aspect of this is to we take these definitions from category theory and we understand that we can apply them to lots of different categories. But as we understand more and more about how useful category theory is, um, we start to be more interested in sort of categorical definitions of things because we get a feeling for how many different places they can be applied in. Okay, so We've also um, encountered this idea of duality, the basic idea that you can reverse the directions of, an arrow, of the arrows in a category to get another category and how this allows us to reflect ideas, to make new kinds of dual ideas. And we've seen that we can get initial objects and co-products in this sort of sense. Now, we've also seen some other kinds of interesting categorical notions like the definition of an exponential object which allows us to think about the kind of collection of arrows from one object to another and sometimes represent such a thing as an object in itself. So this is very important when you're thinking about how to represent things because it gives a new way of representing things. It's also very important in computer science because it represents a set of functions. We've also encountered this natural number object, which is a very interesting thing if you're interested in the kind of foundations of mathematics, because you can see how we can define this kind of infinite set of non-negative whole numbers using category theory. And you'll notice that all of these ideas are all in this big circle here, which is the notion of universal morphisms. So I think universal morphisms are 
a very, very important idea in category theory. I mean, they're essentially defining perfection in some sense. Um, and, you know, we can, we can relate loads of ideas uh, to these universal morphisms. Exponential object is a universal morphism. So is natural number object. So is initial object, co-product, terminal object, product. Okay. Um, so now that's what we've done so far. Now I want to give you a sort of preview of what's coming up. So the next kind of things that we're going to encounter are the idea of limits. And we can think of a limit at this point. I don't really want to um, go through any proper definitions, but I just want to say a limit can be thought of as a sort of generalization of the idea of a product. But it's a very nice generalization. It's a kind of a kind of um, one where once we understand it, um, we basically can sort of set a structure to be whatever we want. And every time we do so, we'll get another object of sort of equal kind of level of power to the notion of product or terminal object. So we can understand, for example, there's, there's a limit called an equalizer, which allows us to understand what solving equations means in a general category. And there's many, many other important limits. And there's also this idea of co-limits, um, which we're also going to encounter. I mean, we kind of get the understanding of that for free by this notion of duality. So we're going to be understanding what limits are in, in the next video. And that's going to be a really sort of powerful thing. Now, we're going to need to know what um, we're going to need to apply the idea of natural transformations to understand what limits are. Um, but once we've done so, um, it's going to be very, very profitable. Now, the real um, thing which I wanted to um, sort of prime you for is something that's coming up after we discuss limits, which is this notion of adjoint functors. OK, so this is extremely interesting, in my opinion. Um, I mean, Saunders MacLean, one of the main guys who sort of came up with category theory in the first place, said that adjoint functors are everywhere and like most of the concepts in category theory can be un understood in terms of them. Um, and they are really extremely beautiful kinds of constructs. And we've already sort of been brushing against this notion when we've encountered this idea of categorical products. Um, in the video duality and functors, I um, I considered this case where there is a categorical product for every pair of objects. And um, in that case, the categorical product, we, we found that that corresponded to a type of functor. And um, in the video on universal morphisms, I explained how um, categorical products is related to this sort of diagonal functor. And it turns out that those two functors in that kind of case are like adjoint functors, okay? The categorical product functor and the diagonal, and the diagonal functor. So we've already sort of been brushing up against this idea of adjoint functors, but it's really an extremely deep idea. So, in the video after the one on limits, um, which is taking me quite a lot of time to prepare for, um, I want to introduce loads and loads of different kinds of perspectives that we can have on these adjoint functors. So we're really sort of climbing this ladder of abstraction. And when we get high enough up, um, things start to become easier. OK, this is really the beauty of the thing. Um, I mean, category theory is fairly difficult to begin with, um, but once you sort of understand enough of the definitions and the way things interrelate, 
it starts to get simpler because it doesn't take as much kind of um, it doesn't take as much kind of brain power to remember all the concepts when you can see like so many ways that things are related to each other. Um, okay, so I just want to say something then about how this is just a kind of personal thing. I know everyone learns differently, but um, something about sort of how to learn category theory, my, my advice, if you like, not, not advice that has to be followed, of course, it's just my personal idea. So I kind of think of mathematics, learning mathematics as a kind of inverted triangle, okay? You have a few concepts at the bottom, in this case, categories, functors, natural transformations, and you really want to understand those because the other concepts, as you kind of learn more, are built upon those sort of basic concepts. So it's important to try to keep a kind of grounding and understanding of what those basic concepts are. And the way that I'm going to try and do this as I go through these definitions um, is with the idea of a product, okay? I, I think that gives us a sort of thread which we can kind of lead up with because we know what a product means in the category sets. We understand what the Cartesian product of sets is. So we have a sort of basis there. And then we can abstract to get the idea of this categorical product. Uh, when we discussed universal morphisms, we explained how, how a product corresponded to one of those. So we can still keep with this idea of a product. When we understood how the product can be considered a functor, that's a very useful idea when we come across the idea of adjoint functors. And when we do limits, we're also going to see that the product is an example of a limit. So when you encounter um, these new ideas, um, try and get something like a product and relate back to that, or at least that's my advice, um, so that you can always keep this kind of um, continuous thread um, of understanding going up. So that's one um, piece of advice. Um, maybe another piece of advice, um, a little bit more um, down to earth, and this is just a personal thing, but when there's a, um, a video, a kind of technical video with lots of definitions which I haven't seen before, my personal approach is, um, firstly, watch that video through on double speed, um, don't worry too much about taking it in, just make sure you're exposed to all of the ideas. Um, and then if there's a particular kind of definition or something that you understand or find interesting, you know, watch that piece again, slow down, and then you can kind of find some piece of that which you're particularly interested in and then really try and understand those definitions. And... I'm a great believer in sort of doing examples and trying to sort of draw the thing out in the most basic way, um, kind of reducing the levels of abstraction until you have something that you can really kind of hold in your hands. And then you can go back up again and see how it all relates together. So we're going to be able to do this with this notion of products. Um, and then I suppose the next step after that is to sort of memorize the definitions of the different things. So, I mean, one doesn't have to memorize everything, but it's pretty useful to be able to remember the basic kind of definitions of the things or, you know, something equivalent to them. And then at that point, um, it's a good idea to start trying to actually prove that things um, relate in a particular way, you know, get the pen and paper out and see if you can reason through them and um, visualize them and so on. So, yeah, that's that's the basic idea. Now, where am I going with 
the future videos, well, as I say, the next one's going to be on limits. The one after that's probably going to be on adjoint functors. I'm a bit undecided on where to go after that. Um, so I'm, I'm sort of divided, like I may do a video on monads um, because I think, you know, people who are doing computer science may be interested in knowing about how monads are defined in category theory. Um, and that's kind of continuing, you know, with these, um, these kind of rather abstract but very useful kind of categorical notions and then I'm also kind of tempted to um, sort of step back down from the abstraction and talk about some more kind of applied category theory so in particular um, I've been reading this book by Spivak Category Theory for the Sciences it's a very interesting book and he talks about how category theory can be related to natural language, like everyday kind of language. And that's a very interesting notion as well. He talks about something called O-logs, which are all about that kind of thing. So I'll just give you a little example, because um, I think it's very interesting, which is we can consider the sentence... A dog is an animal and we can ask well what does that mean how can we understand what this sentence a dog is an animal means in terms of mathematics in terms of dots and arrows in a kind of categorical sense well we can at least give it a interpretation in in the category set because what we can think is well okay we have the set of dogs so this is my parents dog this is the chihuahua that lives down the road this is the largest saint bernard and so on so this is the set of dogs set of all dogs and then we also have the set of all animals okay so this is the largest elephant this is the westmost giraffe and so on and then so this is the set of all animals and then how can we interpret this kind of how can we interpret this kind of sentence well we can say that it means that there's a function a function called is from this set of dogs to this set of animals Okay, so Spivak discusses this idea. Um, he has this notion of something called O-logs, which basically allow us to translate lots of sentences into kind of more, into kind of more kind of mathematical language, the kind of stuff that we can really embed in category theory. And also, I mean, these interesting kinds of concepts in category theory like products and different kinds of limits that we're going to encounter and so on uh, lots of those can be given kind of interpretations in terms of natural language as well so this is also this kind of connection with natural language is also a kind of idea that i'm really looking forward to getting on with